Thumbs up, everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nastainuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'uzu billahi min shuri anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudhil falahadiyala. Ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la shirika la anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanutuku allaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tumutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Ya ayyuhal nas attaku rabukum alazi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a wa taku allahi alazi tusa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha ka'ana alaykum rakiba. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanutuku allaha wa kulu kolun sadida yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum zanubukum من يدي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد All thanks and praises my dear brothers and sisters belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek Allah's help and forgiveness We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds and whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance and I bear witness that there is no God but Allah that without any partners and I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. For you have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. He will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly obtained a great attainment. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm always grateful that I have these opportunities to reflect on the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, um, I'm here today to do just that reflect with you on one of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'd like to remind myself first, and then all of you watching and listening there, Allah invites us all to the Quran and to learn from the life and seerah of the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is up to us to accept this invitation, nobody else. We can be forced to it, but it's not going to have the same impact than we going to it. As the saying goes, you can you know, lead a camel to the water, but you can't force the camel to drink the water. So today I'd like to talk to you, inshallah, about the word or the name Al-Afu, which means the partner. The root word, just like all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are rooted in Arabic, which usually have a three-letter root word, and that is Ain, Fa, and Wa. And the meaning of this root word is to pardon, to forgive, to remove, or to annul. Now, there are many names among the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that overlap in some way, but in varying degrees. So the partner, Al-Afu, is like is similar to another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the all-forgiving or al ghafur You know, but the difference is small. So if we think about Al-Afu, Al-Afu means wiping the slate clean. It's like starting over. And we see this example in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. So if you think of, if you remember the story of Moses and uh, the Israelites, in one section in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah talks about the time when Moses was sent away. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 51 and 52, Allah says, And remember when we appointed 40 nights for Moses, when you worship the calf in his absence, acting wrongfully. Even then, we still forgave you, so perhaps you would be grateful. So this was the time when Musa, alayhi salam, or Moses, was sent uh, away on a mission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his brother Aaron or Harun was asked to take care of his uh, his people. But during this time that he was away, uh, they had taken up worship uh, of a calf. And this was, you know, in this verse, Allah is reminding us that uh, this was not a good act, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. So worshiping the calf was actually an act of shirk. And shirk is one of the most egregious or the most egregious act we can commit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're taking away the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped. And we know from the Quran that Allah has created humans and jinns for the purpose of worship. So taking that away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most egregious act. So Allah is telling us that despite this act, Allah forgave them. And Allah says, Thumma afumna ankum min ba'di zalika la'allakum tashkurun. And it's important to note from this verse that Allah is saying, afauna, to completely forgive or pardon them for their transgression. So in the English language, pardon means to set aside the consequences or punishment that would have followed 
some form of transgression. So Allah is telling us that despite the Israelites committing the worst of sins, shirk, which is punishable by hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them by wiping their sins clean. Why? And Allah tells us also in that same verse, so that they would be grateful. لَأَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that we may know the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than even the most egregious act that we could commit against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, Allah has rights over us just as we have rights over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and over one another. And it is this respect of these rights that Allah gives us in our religion of Islam that, that Allah is using these examples and these stories to teach us. And this being mentioned in the Quran is also a lesson for all the believers of all times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to clean the slate, wipe it clean completely, even for the worst of sins that we can commit. And this is a message of hope for all of us. By knowing this, we should rejoice. We should kick despair to the curb. You know, some of us may struggle sometimes with staying away from haram acts or things like that. And sometimes with no fault of our own. We live in a time and in a society where keeping halal 100% of the time is a challenge. You know, and, and, and I can think of a, a simple example in the finance products we use, for instance, you know, if you have a bank account, it will earn and accumulate interest while we know that interest is haram for, for Muslims. Allah calls that out in the Quran as well. Uh, you know, or when we have a, a mortgage or a loan or a debt that we're paying back, that will have interest as well. And we don't have a choice in those regards sometimes. We just have to, you know, pay that interest, but we try and pay it, the debt off as quickly as we can. So even, even as best as we try, there is going to be instances when it is difficult for us to stay, you know, or live that 100% halal lifestyle. Um, you know, even consider watching or listening to music or watching the television, for example. You know, you can turn on a TV show and without warning, something will happen on the, on the screen that, uh, you know, will cause you to look away or maybe skip forward very quickly. So just watching and listening will cause us to run into some of these acts that are that are haram. So rather than wallow in our inability to stop engaging in haram, you know, we should remember and recite the dua that our beloved Prophet ﷺ taught Aisha, which I'll get to it in a little bit. But our entire existence, you know, there will be moments when we will falter. Even when we don't falter, you know, we should ask Allah to, to pardon our transgressions, to just clean our slate completely. And speaking of transgression, you know, imagine if we committed uh, a heinous crime. Uh, and because we have committed a crime that is that violates a law, you know, we could be punished by incarceration. In that moment, how would our friends and family members see us afterwards? What would they think of us? How will they find the courage to welcome us back into their fold? You know, even if we were deeply remorseful. And even if we paid, uh, you know, the debt to society, according to our established laws. You know, imagine, would we be invited back into the communities we used to belong to? Would our friends and family and community members embrace us back? Maybe except for a few, if we're lucky. Nobody else would probably welcome us back into their circles. And we would be forever remembered for the one bad thing that we did than all the good that we may have done either before that moment or after that moment. And it will be our reputation will be forever tarnished. And nobody would want to associate with us if that were the case with us. You know, everybody would distance ourselves from it. And there would be no opportunity for us to wipe our slate clean. But not in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is telling us that Allah is willing to wipe our slate clean if we are willing to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that goes back to that, that um, mention in Surah Al-Baqarah where the Israelites return back and Allah is telling them so that, you know, you may be grateful. In an authentic hadith where uh, it was recorded by Tirmidhi, Aisha ta'ala was asking the, the Prophet ﷺ, um, you know, what should I do when the night, if I, if I enter the night, if I find the night of Laylatul Qadr, then what should I say in it? And the Prophet ﷺ says, you should ask Allah, Allahumma innaka afun tuhibu lafwa faqo anni. Oh Allah, you are pardoning you love pardon, so pardon me. Allahumma innaka afun tuhebulafu afafu ani. Simple and easy dua for us to memorize. 
And notice in this dua that our beloved Prophet ﷺ is sharing with Aisha radiallahu anha, he's telling her to ask Allah to wipe the slate of our sins clean. Not just forgiveness, but to wipe it clean. And this dua is saying, oh Allah, you are pardoning. Allahumma inna ka afun. You are pardoning. You love pardon. Tuhibbul afwa. Pardon me. Fafu anni. And you can also build on this dua by adding one more aspect to it. Allahumma inna ka afun. Kareemun tuhibbul afwa. Fafu anni. Oh Allah, indeed, you are pardoning. Kareemun generous. You love pardon. So pardon me. Such a powerful and simple dua from our Prophet Sallallahu Asking Allah not only to forgive us, but to wipe our slate clean. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this dua in the context of Laylatul Qadr. However, we can repeat this dua anytime we make dua. So in your salah, you can ask for this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an important act for Muslims to learn. Just as much as gratitude is, repentance is too. You know, we should never stop asking Allah to pardon us. And among the hadith recorded, uh, in Sahih Muslim, we find the story of a person who, by our measure, would be unworthy of pardon. This person was terrible. He had killed 99 people at that point in time. And this hadith, as re reported by um, Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, as the Prophet ﷺ was telling the story of this person, and this person was searching for someone to tell him whether or not his repentance can be accepted. So he goes to one of the monks, asks this monk, you know, tells him his story, asks him, can I be forgiven? Can I seek repentance for what I've done? The monk says, no, there is no chance for repentance for you. So he goes and kills this monk. And then he continues on this journey and then makes the same inquiry over and over again from any scholar, any people of spirituality that he meets until he's told about this one village where he was told, pious people lived. And he's hurrying his way to this village until he meets his death. And then in his last breath, he crawls towards this village where these pious people live, where he'd heard these pious people lived. And then he's overtaken by death. And in this moment when he died, there was a dispute between the angels of mercy and the angels of punishment. And they measured his distance from where he had died to this village and they found that he was closer to this village than he was from the previous place. And that was enough for him to receive forgiveness. And this is from one of the hadiths you can find in Sahih Muslim. And it's a beautiful narration that tells us that, you know, struggle, struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the struggle is internal within ourselves. And it's about the power of seeking repentance, even though we have those struggles within us. So this action, this person killing over 100 people, reprehensible by every measure that we know about. But Allah is telling us that Allah's mercy is greater than anything we could do. And this is a good segue for us to talk about the difference between pardon and forgiveness, afu and hufa. So we've discussed afu quite a bit already. It's literally wiping the slate of our sins clean. You know, what happens when you wipe something clean completely? There's absolutely nothing left there to see. So by extension, you know, when our sins are wiped clean, there's nothing left there to talk about. So everything that was there is all gone. Alhamdulillah. Another way to think about this is that if our sins are cleaned, our sins are completely wiped away, then there's nothing for us to be, to be uh, asked about on the Day of Judgment. And what a beautiful thing that would be if we had none of that shame carrying around with us or moving around with us. You know, and forgiveness, let's spend a minute on that. If we look at the, the definition of uh, forgiveness or to forgive from an English language dictionary perspective, it means to stop feeling resentful uh, towards someone, towards a flaw, towards a mistake. And if someone causes us grief and we say we forgive them, we are letting go of that ill feeling that overtakes us. So we choose to move on from that experience when we forgive someone who makes us feel that, that way. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us, Allah is covering up our mistakes. Allah is giving us a chance to redeem ourselves. What, what does it mean for us on the Day of Judgment when you have those mistakes covered up? You know, Allah may still ask us about it. You know, it's not the same as being pardoned, but it's 
still on our record. You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reducing the weight of that in our in our book of records. You know, but we should still ask Allah for forgiveness as well as pardon. You know, and what good is learning about a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, if we don't contemplate how we can apply that to our own lives. And this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Afu, is a good source of learning for us. And we can apply this quality in our own lives as well by emulating it ourselves as well. It's a way for us to humble ourselves when we feel angry or upset. In an authentic hadith recorded by Tirmadhi, Abu Huraira narrates that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Charity does not diminish wealth. Allah does not decrease a man or increase a man in anything for his pardoning others but in honor. And none humbles himself for Allah, but Allah raises him. So our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us that we are increased in honor by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala when we choose to pardon. So if somebody transgresses against us and we choose to pardon that person, Allah will elevate us in status. And that is that is not that is going against the human nature. Our human nature is to be vengeful. We want to, you know, make things even when something is wrong or someone wrongs us. And sometimes when we are in a hurry, you know, getting back from work, for example, or going back home or getting to school, you know, even the little things could trigger us to anger and frustration. You know, you could have somebody just cut you off on the road and then all of a sudden you're feeling this, oh. You know, I, I just was wronged. And then you feel that moment of anger, but letting that pass over you and pardoning that other person for doing that is elevating ourselves beyond our animal instinct. You know, that animal state within us, we have the capacity to think and elevate beyond what uh, the capacity of an animal is. And if you also made dua for them in that moment, and there was somebody else in the car with you, then alhamdulillah, you have just created a great example for somebody else to follow by actually you know, pardoning them and then making a dua for their benefit. So by setting aside our feeling of anger and replacing it with a positive action, we can practice this attribute. And it's hard. You know, I, I, I know it's hard because it's hard for all of us and it's going to be a challenge, but this is how we can emulate this for ourselves. And we're all prone to transgressions, my brothers and sisters. You know, we do it regularly. Not a day goes by that we don't do something that we regret, even, even slightly. And Shaykh Ibn Atayla in his book, Kitab al-Hikam, or Book of Wisdoms, remind us that we as people give from miserliness while Allah gives from his generosity. And what the Shaykh is reminding us is that any act of kindness that we deliver, you know, whether it's giving our time or giving money, you know, it usually comes from a need that we have inside. We want to feel celebrated. We want to feel fulfilled. And it is a need to feel that, that we generally engage in these acts of kindness. And we must always remind ourselves that, you know, when we decide we're going to spend our time here, we're going to spend our money there, that we should not come from a mindset of scarcity because it's easy for us to say, hey, I can't spend that, you know, I can't give anything today because I don't have anything for my living expenses or budget. And that's okay. Allah doesn't ask us for, for money only. Allah asks us, to give from what we have. And it's up to us to decide what we have. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, however, the Shaykh is indicating that Allah gives from generosity, from his bounty, which is greater than anything we could ever possess. You know, So having that mindset of um, expanse rather than scarcity is an important one for us to take home as well because we can then benefit. It's not just about what we don't have. It's also about what we do have and thinking about what we do have and what we can give from it is being generous. So no matter how we are in this world, my dear brothers and sisters, we should never stop seeking Allah's mercy and Allah's pardon. And this is one of the lessons we can take away from this attribute as well. And never fall into despair. Absolutely never. And then, you know, when we do that, we are actually hurting ourselves even more. You know, in Surah Al-Yusuf, verse 87, Allah tells us, and do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah, for no one loses hope in Allah's mercy except those with no faith. Think about that. Allah is telling us that if you have faith, then don't lose hope. Don't fall into despair. And Allah has the capacity to remove all of our sins. He can wipe our slate. And so all we must do is ask. And this is the generosity of your Lord. This level of clemency is what we should all incorporate in ourselves. And we should build that muscle of empathy inside ourselves as well, so that we can feel that we are emulating the qualities of Al-Afu. 
And in our Islamic jurisprudence, in our Islamic tradition, you know, there is this concept of clemency, and this attribute reflects that that tradition within our Islamic uh, jurisprudence. Inshallah, may Allah elevate our understanding of the Quran, and may we live our lives under the guidance of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and may we all be increased in knowledge. And may Allah give us wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters, you know, asking Allah's mercy and pardon should not be limited to the times when we sin. You know, even our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who is free from sin, would still ask for Allah's forgiveness, more so to set an example for all of us to follow. And we know this from the many du'as in the hadith that we can find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite. Uh, and we also find du'as from the Quran that we can recite. In uh, Imam an nawawis collection of hadith called Riyadh al-Salihin, uh, there's an authentic hadith where the Messenger of Allah you know, finishes his salah and he would beg for forgiveness three times by saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And then he would follow that by saying, Allahumma anta salam, uminka salam, tabarakta ya zul jalali wa ikram. Which means, Oh Allah, you are the bestower of security. Security comes from you. Blessed are you. O possessor of glory and honor. So inshallah, the next time uh, you pray your salah, remember this uh, sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ where he would say, Astaghfirullah three times, and then he would recite this dua, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarik ta yazul jalali wa ikram. And inshallah, may Allah guide us all. May Allah, uh, may we all receive Allah's guidance and may we all accept, may Allah accept all of our du'as and accept those from who are uh, less fortunate as well. Let's make dua, inshallah. In the Muslims and Muslims, and the Muslims and the Muslims, and the Qanites and the Qanites, and the Sadiqs and the Sadiqs, and the Sabirs and the Sabirs, and the Khashis and the Khashis, and the Mutasaddiqs and the Mutasaddiqs, and the Sa'imes and the Sa'imes, and the Hafizes and the Furujahs and the Hafizes, and the Zakirs and Allah and the Zakirs, 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 and the وَكَفِرْ عَنَّا سَيَّاتِنَا وَتُوَفْنَا مَا لَبْرَارِ رَبَنَا فِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدِيَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَكُمُ الْحِسَابِ رَبَنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبِنَا بَعْضَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَحَبْنَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَابِ رَبَنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَاغْفِرْ ل يا أيزكم لا ألكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون وسلام للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين اللهم آمين